Tord's Quick 2.0. Lighter, faster, better. No stronger. Interesting choice. I've had people asking me about Quick since my channel started, and I don't talk about it enough, even though I did have Mishko on as one of my first ever stream guests. He's an absolute legend. He created Angular and has done his best to apologize for it by creating Quick. It's not my thing. I have my reservations about Quick. I specifically feel like the problems it's focused on are not necessarily the ones we should be focused on as we build for the web, but it is important that we have people focusing on things like how long it takes for pages to hydrate or how long it takes for things to become interactive. And I am thankful for the Quick team for pushing as hard as they have, but I also am very curious what they're up to in the future because right now it's not super compelling. A Quick 2 very well could change that. So let's take a look at this post by the Quick team to see if Quick 2 might give me enough reason to finally check out the framework. Quick prides itself on having an instant on application with an HTML first approach. We have performed a lot of comparison testing and in each case, resumability wins over hydration in terms of JS downloaded, executed, and delayed before the user interaction is processed and we're really excited about that. Resumability comes with a cost. In Quick 2, we're focused on lowering these costs further, and we'd like to discuss them here. Oh boy, is this post going to address the fact that resumability isn't perfect for everything and explain how they want to work around that? Very exciting. For a system to be resumable, the HTML must encode additional information. Point one is that it must encode the listener location. This is in the form of an attribute, and it is very small. Two is it has to encode the component boundaries. This bit is a non-trivial amount of additional HTML text. We'll focus on this at the end. Interesting. Point three is the application state. We're also making improvements here, but this will be for a later post. Okay, I'm very interested in a quick post focused entirely on application state. That sounds very up my alley. They also call out here that they're committed to backwards compatibility, so they're not planning to introduce any breaking changes in the 2.0 release. However, they feel that this is a significant rewrite of the internals, so it's a reason to celebrate. Oh boy. Understanding the application. Whichever framework you choose, the framework must understand the application's internal structure. By this, we mean knowing where the component boundaries are, which text nodes are bound to which expressions, where to insert new rows in a loop, and so on. This data is a kind of tree where the framework has references to the relevant DOM nodes so that it can update them. So how do we get a hold of that tree? Well, there are two choices. One is that we can re-execute the application and rebuild the tree from code, which is hydration. The other option is we can serialize the tree into the HTML somehow, which Turns out the HTML is already such a tree, it's just missing a few things. Interesting. For those who aren't in the weeds enough to know what all these terms mean, I'll give a quick TLDR. When you run a React application that was server rendered, you run React on the server, and the result is an HTML file. The HTML file has all of the things that you rendered when you run that on the server, but also has a JavaScript tag that includes the JavaScript for your application for React and all those other things. When your browser gets the page, it gets the HTML with all the stuff in it, and then it gets the JavaScript tag that will make things interactive going forward. But when you have have an on click that you wrote in React, how does React know which button that on click goes to? Technically speaking, it can't. So what they do instead is they rerun the same code that ran on the server, but they run it on the client so that you can get all of the data attached because the output HTML matches. You're effectively running the same code twice, once on the server and then afterwards again on the client in order to make things bind correctly so when you click a button, it actually does it. This is far from the fastest thing in the world and it's kind of the thing that Quick was built to fight directly. They hate this concept of hydration. And I'm sure a lot of you do too, if you've ever had a hydration error when you had a date time in your component that ran on the server and the client. Dealing with the mismatch when you run the same JavaScript twice sucks, which is why there's so much effort being put in to avoiding that by binding things different ways. The way something like Quick works is they're including metadata in the HTML so the JavaScript knows which element it attaches to. So you need to rerun all the JavaScript just to know which line of code in JS applies to which element on your DOM. How it's done in Quick version one. Let's take a look at a minimal component. If you're already using React, this probably looks pretty familiar. You create a component. Catches you have to use their helper to create a component because of how they do the bindings underneath. But everything else feels a lot like React. Const count equals use signal. Maybe a little more like solid, but same general pattern. We then return count colon count dot value. Now we have an on click. Notice the dollar sign. This dollar sign is how you tell Quick to bind these things together. It's meant to be a signal to the compiler. Hey, we need to allow this JavaScript to run here in this place, and then the compiler can bind things properly in the future. We then have a layout, which is another component that happens to mount the slot, which I'm assuming gets passed here. Like, yeah, main, counter, main. Cool. Pretty traditional stuff. The output HTML looks like this. We have the top div with a container that has pause as the value, render is static SSR, version dev, base build. Yeah, anybody's complaining about Tailwind and they're also using Quick, Fuck you. Anyways, I wanna talk about semantic HTML because this is not semantic HTML at all. 
to each their own. We have the main element, which we showed above there. Then we have all of these comments that are in the HTML. These might seem simple and unnecessary, but these comments are actually how Quick works. They're used for the JavaScript to know what is where, so it can apply things like this text here correctly. When you increase the count, it needs to update just this part, not count or the things above and below it. So they do that by surrounding it with these comments to allow the JavaScript to trigger this tiny little piece inside of the HTML. When we look at the button on click, this is being bound via the thing we talked about before, as well as the ID so that it knows which JavaScript is supposed to run. And at the bottom, we have the quick JSON blob. This blob has a lot of the bindings. I'm sure they'll explain this in a second. Right away, you might notice that quick needs to create virtual nodes in the form of comments. So why does quick need this information? Well, the first part here, the example, a parent layout component, not shown, is used for routing. The parent components create the main element and projects the route content, which is the counter, into the layout component. So the framework needs to know where the component projected output should be inserted. Quick needs a virtual node for that. This syntax here is for one of those virtual nodes. Which one is this? Is this the this one ID'd? Yeah, idea seven. So this is the second virtual node. There's three layers of virtual nodes before count, and then a fourth one before the number. So the second virtual node represents the counter component. The component requires component props, which are stored in the data section, which is in the quick JSON thing below. The component requires component props, which are stored in the data section, which is this quick JSON bit at the bottom. I will say this is not that scary a pattern. This is done in almost every major framework, especially with the React Next.js stuff, where when you pass props to components, it needs to know where they are. It embeds a little JSON blob in the HTML so the JavaScript knows what was put where. The additional attributes are used to cross-reference the props with the virtual node. A key point of resumability is that one should be able to re-render a component without the parent component needing to be resumed as well. But components need to get props from the parent, so the props need to be serialized and recoverable so that this component can render independently of others. Quick needs a virtual node for that. Then we have this third node where the counter component JSX has a top-level fragment represented by our favorite empty brackets. This is a thing in React as well. It's necessary because each component needs to return one JSX element, and this lets you take three elements and make them one element. In order to do that, Quick needs yet another virtual node. After that, we need to make the counter update work. So we need another virtual element because this isn't its own div. If we had wrapped this in something like, I don't know, like a span before doing this, I might be able to bind to that instead. But honestly, I would expect another virtual node below that as well. And then we have even more of these attributes that are littered throughout the HTML that are serialized state to refer back to the DOM nodes. So now let's talk about the inefficiencies. The first inefficiency is pruning. In the above example, the counter component will never be downloaded to the client. This is because a user interaction cannot trigger a structural change like adding and removing DOM elements, and Quick can already update the count signal without the component present, meaning the extra virtual nodes we've been maintaining are not needed. The complication is that Quick streams the data to the client. Quick can't determine that a component is static and therefore not needed until after Quick sees the whole application because there could be some component later on that could do some sneaky stuff. Quick is forced to generate this extra content just in case. IDs. When serializing data, Quick needs to be able to refer back to the DOM nodes. For example, attaching props to components, updating signal values, or having references to the components. However, because Quick streams the HTML as it renders, it doesn't know if the data will be needed because it hasn't gotten that far in the stream. And by the time Quick has sufficient information to make the determination, the content's already been sent to the client. One more important piece about the hydration versus resumability that we've touched on a little bit here is that not everything needs to be hydrated. Like in the HTML example here, does it really matter if main or count are hydrated? Because these things will never update. There's no way for these to change. Change. These could just be part of the template, so to speak, and we only need JavaScript for the button. This is how server components work, which is why they're so compelling. When something doesn't have client-side JavaScript, it doesn't need to be hydrated in the traditional sense because it's just part of the HTML template. And with server components, use client means this portion needs to be hydrated. So you're able to only do the hydration for the parts that need it. A client component will still run on server and on client, so that code still runs twice, but a server component's code doesn't run on the client, runs on the server, it generates HTML, and then that HTML is used as the state, kind of, to render the correct thing on the client. For context, all frameworks need this information, so this is not unique to Quick. The unique bit is that other frameworks get this information by rerunning the components on the client side, where Quick gets it from the HTML so it can resume. If you're not already familiar with the concept of resumability, I 
probably should hammer it in here. If you're familiar with hibernation on Windows, it's a similar idea where when you traditionally boot a computer, you have a bunch of data on your hard drive that has to spin up and run and do things, put some stuff in memory, spin up, run more, do more, put that in memory over and over again until it has everything you need for your OS. And then you open an application and it has to do all of that again. The concept of hibernation for computers is it takes what you have in your RAM right now, so the things that are open, and it saves that exactly as is on your hard drive. So when you want to boot your computer again, it just takes that exact state from your hard drive and puts it back in your RAM and you can skip all of those steps. Resumability is trying to do the same thing for the browser. Whereas I described before with React and Hydration, you're rebuilding everything on the client after the server has done it. Resumability is that you're trying to embed all of the data necessary so you can skip that step and just immediately go to the state of the code being bound again. So the same way you're storing however much RAM you have in your hard drive, Quick is storing all of its state and bindings in the HTML. So that's what resumability is. You can think of it like hibernation. Let's see how Quick 2 resolves these issues. In Quick 2.0, we are fixing serialization issues to make Quick even faster and more efficient. The philosophy is as follows. One, move all non-human readable data to the end of the HTML stream. We still need to know where the component boundaries are, but by moving them to the end of the HTML, we can render the UI faster and then deliver the data to the framework runtime. Point two, come up with a more efficient encoding scheme for the virtual nodes. And point three, make the resuming algorithm even lazier so we materialize only the virtual nodes that are needed for the processing to handle user input, further reducing the runtime cost. We're excited to share we're progressing excellently on this front. Let's take a look at this new HTML, div. Q container is paused, render static, version dev, still has all of these state things so that quick knows if things have been hydrated or sorry, resumed or not, or if they're still in the paused state. But there is no more weirdness here. There is script type quick state and script type quick v node. Interesting. But all of those comments are gone finally. The output is super clean, and yet all the same information is still encoded in the output. Let's figure out how. Moving virtual nodes to the end of the HTML. This seems to be the big piece here. Instead of having the virtual node information mixed within the HTML output, it's now all moved to the end in the script type equals quick slash vnode element, placed at the end of the document. This means the content rendered by the browser for the user can get to the user even faster. Recovering virtual nodes. Quick still needs to have the virtual nodes, so the information can't disappear, but now it's shrunken to just these nine characters. Situation point hdb1, yeah? Let's figure out how this works. I do not understand initially. So here's the state we need to recover. So we have the HTML, we have this JavaScript, and we need to know what applies where. So how do we know the signal value is at a certain place in the DOM such that we could update it? We need to recover that state. Note that this is more of a VDOM than HTML, yes. This is the code that runs in QuickLand, not DOM browser land. We need to bind it to the DOM. So we need to identify the main element. We need to identify that main contains a virtual node represented by counter. We need to identify that counter contains a virtual fragment represented by the fragment, like open close bracket. We also need to identify that there are three text nodes and the second text node is bound to the signal. This is gonna be tricky because HTML merged the text nodes into a single one, yeah. We don't have in the HTML here, these things separated. This is one piece of text, but we need to be able to update this bit without updating the whole thing. So how do we get quick and how do we get the JavaScript to separate this piece, bind it correctly, and let us update our state? Let's see how we do it. First, they use the document create tree walker API to retrieve all DOM nodes in depth in the first order. Interesting. Our benchmarks show that retrieving 50,000 nodes is possible in about 20 milliseconds. 50,000 nodes is an extremely large document. For comparison, Quick only has to retrieve the elements, whereas with hydration, you must retrieve, walk, and reconcile the elements. You actually have to re-render them all which is craziness. Additionally, the TreeWalker API does not need to be consumed all at once. Instead, you can split it over many idle microtasks to spread the load. They're already using that API to retrieve all the comments in the current implementation, and it's pretty performant. That's good to hear. The other part is they use a depth first sequence of numbers to identify each node. This way, we don't have to assign IDs to them all. Even without an explicit ID, Quick can identify any node, whether an element or a virtual node. It's just a text node. Interesting. There's only one text node, so how do we break that up? We have ways to identify browser extensions that inject extra nodes, but that's a different box. Yeah, browser extensions and the damage they do to these frameworks is insane. Like one fun one that I dealt with when I was at Twitch wasn't even an extension. It was the browser translations. When you let Chrome translate the page from one language to another, that would break React's understanding of the page content and further updates would both randomly break and often cause crazy infinite loops that caused huge memory leaks for us at Twitch. It was something I put a lot of time into figuring out. So what the hell is this set of characters? This looks like Rust code, not 
a binding to HTML. The exclamation point encodes how many elements to skip to get to the main element. The bracket represents the main element having a virtual element. This stores the component props, and that information is stored in the script type equals quick state part, which they're not covering here. Again, I'm very excited for that state block host. The next bracket is the component element, which contains an additional virtual node represented by these here. H appears to be used as an index where it tells you that you can go seven characters in for the first node. So the first node is count colon space. D is the third zero indexed letter. So the next node is these three letters here. And then the final node is B, which is one. So it's the last exclamation point at the end. And the number one at the end represents the number of elements to consume. So in this case, it's just the button. Hmm. Think that makes sense. I will say zero indexed letters, interesting choice, but to each their own. And he calls out here that they can store strings longer than 26 characters. They can also use lowercase letters to extend the encoding to grab any number of characters. The uppercase letters are used both to encode length as well as delimiters for the next encoding, saving a comma. Interesting, the uppercase letters let you know it's just that one thing. That's a, that's a very interesting design. It's like a pseudo hex. Advantages. By shifting the encoding of the virtual nodes to the end, Quick can now perform additional tree shaking of the data. Because Quick has seen all of the components in the application at this point, it can safely apply heuristics and remove unneeded data. For example, it can drop the virtual nodes and their IDs. Our counter example shows that it encodes all of its virtual nodes to simplify it. But still, Quick would determine that no code path would require structural change. And hence, it would determine that these virtual nodes are not needed and remove them. This would further decrease the amount of HTML being sent, and because the new encoding uses depth-first indexing, no additional unneeded IDs are left behind. So let's talk about the lazy virtual nodes. Interesting concept. We mostly talked about encoding, but there's also a runtime discussion to be had. We will not go deeply into it here, but we wanted to point out a few things. One thing is that the new virtual node implementation uses arrays to store data rather than objects. Arrays facilitate growing the data you store easily without being penalized. You can store all your data for a virtual node in a single array, relieving memory pressure. Another advantage is that arrays are always monomorphic and have fast access under all conditions. All of this is done to lower the memory pressure of the virtual nodes. Monomorphic performance and craziness around arrays in JavaScript is a hack that a lot of frameworks use. One of my favorite examples of this is React with hooks, where hooks are indexed in an array. When you call use state, it's not referencing the use state, it's referencing an index for that component's hooks, which is why if you put a hook under an if statement, it breaks. It breaks because React needs to know where every hook is in that order so it can call them efficiently without having to find something with some key. Back to quick though, because these points are interesting. Point two is that the new implementation follows a lazy approach. It prioritizes efficiency and minimizes unnecessary work. Parsing the script type is quick slash vnode does not create any virtual nodes eagerly. These nodes are created lazily on an as needed basis to further save on memory allocation. The result is that the virtual node tree is very sparse and only contains a materialized view of the nodes needed for the operation. In our example, only the virtual nodes would be related to the signal, not the whole component. Finally, the virtual node understands that the underlying DOM has a single text node and several virtual nodes sharing those text nodes. The system retains a single text node until Quick writes into the signal node, and it is only at the time the system creates new text nodes and spits the text over them. How do I simplify this point? So when we had count colon number exclamation point, that's still just one text node. It doesn't matter that it can be three nodes until we click the button and it needs to change. So we don't evaluate that until we have the potential to do that. So until the button's on the screen and it is loaded as JavaScript, that binding doesn't exist and it's just one node. The virtual nodes come in when necessary to trigger the update. Coming next is data serialization. We haven't discussed changes that we are doing to the data yet. That will be a topic for another blog post, but these changes are equally as important and as interesting a deep dive as well. Exciting. Let me know in the comments if I should check that out when it drops. Exciting future for the Quick community. Before we end this 2.0 teaser blog post, we wanted to also share another thing we're planning for the upcoming version. During the past few months, we ran a few surveys and gathered feedback from a lot of you Quick developers in our community. We asked what you loved about Quick and what you thought could improve. The most common feedback we got from you was the following. One, you want more Quick ecosystem projects, like a component library. Two, you want Quick to feel more like a community project. And three, you want even more activity on the core framework. I'm gonna call this point out in particular because something that's always frustrated me and a slight prime call out here. A lot of creators that aren't as deep in the React ecosystem, like Prime, seem to think the prolification of React packages is meant to showcase a failure in React. Like the fact that we have popper and then a React popper binding, 
or we have HLSJS for video and then React HLSJS for React suggests that React needs these helper packages to have good experiences with these things where something like Svelte doesn't, which is why we don't see those packages. That's a lie. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of what's actually happening here. Every framework needs some amount of massaging in order to attach these other packages that exist in vanilla JS land to our framework in a meaningful usable, composable way. The difference is a combination of React making it very easy to do that in an externalized package and the size of the React ecosystem, meaning we have a lot of these solutions already made. The reality is that the React HLS package is very similar to what I would have had to build if I was building it myself. The fact that it can be shared in a compartmentalized, composable way is one of the biggest strengths of React. And Svelte couldn't do this because of how weird their way of binding equals is. You couldn't have something you wrote outside of a Svelte file, update things inside of a Svelte file, unless you bind listeners in the Svelte file, because the way listeners work at Svelte used to be with the equal sign. This is why runes are so exciting, because for the first time, Svelte can actually have composable packages that you install in your project without having to do a bunch of weird bindings to just do the thing. So finally, Svelte can have these wins too. And with such, I would expect things like the Shad UI equivalent for Svelte to get much more love and attention in the near future, even if the Svelte community is pissed that runes look different. Quick from what I've seen from its design, doesn't necessarily have these problems and is a little more similar to React with how these bindings work. So they should have this ecosystem, but they don't have enough developers to have it just yet. So we'll see where it goes. It's cool to see that the team is focused on helping with quick UI now, which is very important. I can't think of any other major framework where the core framework team is working on a UI library for it. I am curious, how much is this meant to just be their equivalent? Well, they have a headless kit. Is it just headless? Do they not have a design version? Makes sense. Still very, very early. Apparently it's Radix based or it's just their Radix equivalent. Yeah, these things are hard to build and they have to build the whole thing from scratch in order to catch up. So uh, best of luck to them. We also decided to listen to our community and to make Quick feel more open to more contributors and companies who'd like to support its development. Seems like they're working on some fun things for the community. I'm curious to see what that is. I was just corrected by Jack Shelton, who is one of the Quick UI contributors, who pointed out that the core team's pretty hands off overall with Quick UI still. I'm curious if that's going to change as things go forward with Quick 2. But yeah, that makes sense. I appreciate the work you're doing a ton. Like those are the unappreciated pieces that are necessary for something like Quick to be relevant. So huge shout out to Jack for the work on that. Hope the team continues to support you going forward. Quick shout out to Builder.io. They're putting a lot of work into this and it's cool to see a company that's building useful tools for developers, also having major stakes in the general dev tool ecosystem. Even if Quick's not for me, I can respect the work the builder's doing. Good stuff. I think that's all I have to say about Quick for now. If I should talk about these other things in the future, let me know. But I'm curious what you think. Is Quick exciting? Is it weird? Is it scary? Or just something you don't really care about? I'm curious as I gauge which content and which frameworks I should be talking about more going forward. So let me know in the comments. Until next time, peace nerds.